Okay, our audiences, uh, we're starting the part two discussion with uh, Jeff Pierce. Great discussion. Thank you for joining us. So. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think that's why we're, we're having these discussions because um, it's important um, to kind of not just network, but also to share ideas and um, on, you know, and on the importance of you know, learning from other countries and why it's important to be unified, why it's important to, um, to, to remain united. Uh, and as you said, I mean, uh, not just enemies, but, uh, you know, ec economic uh, difficulties. Um, there's a lot of strength, um, uh, you know, with a country um, uh, remaining um, as 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 uh, as strong as possible. Well, look at look at the way look at the way that your uh, American your fellow Americans reacted. Good people. This is not meant to be insulting to the American people. I wrote a whole book on Canada versus the United States, which actually ends with singing the virtues of American values in terms of freedom of the press, freedom of religion, blah blah blah. Um, this is not meant to be disparaging of Americans. Most Americans, I believe, are of good conscience, are horrified by the US Capitol attack. Um, and they're looking at what's going on and how hardly anybody's still being held accountable. They're going, my God. So when, again, I am not a stooge or advocate for Prime Minister Abe, but would remember when he compared the uh, attack on the Ethiopian North, Northern Defense Force to the American Civil War. And the Western media went, <laughs> and they sort of thought, oh, well, isn't that precious? Well, he seems to know American history better than some Americans. <laughs> because if you remember American history, it started with an attack on a military base. <laughs> you know, uh, that's how the U.S. Civil War got started. Uh, so he knows U.S. history better than some Americans do. Uh, and the comparison is apt. Um, so it's not meant to be disparaging to Americans. Try to relate your horror of the U.S. Capitol attack to what many Ethiopians must have felt when they wake up to this attack on the Defense Force. And then better still, you know, the thing which changed my opinion and pushed me further, you have a whole video of their people confessing, their spokesmen confessing, yeah, we did it. It's preemptive attack. We did it. <laughs> you know, Israel did something like that. So, you know, we took a page from their book. Uh, you realize you just made a full out confession there, right? <laughs> you know, what are you supposed to think? These are the facts of the example. You know, where, where are you supposed to go from there? You know, um, so we have to look at things as they are, see things as they are, as George Orwell put it. We have to see them as they are. Thanks, Jeff. So I want to also kind of touch, since you also have the background in journalism, one of the things that I noticed um, is, you know, obviously with uh, social media and all the new technologies, uh, journalism has changed a lot. And um, I mean, before, uh, I mean, I guess a little about, I say, I would say about, you know, at least, at least 10 years ago, you could write a, you know, a great, interesting article and submit it to the local, you know, to the, uh, news outlets, you know, it gets, uh, edited, they see it, they might, you know, you might get back and there's a chance of you getting it published as long as you're, <laughs> a story. Yeah. but now, I mean, I've, I've tried myself and I've seen, you know, the steps and it's almost like, you know, news, news, the news journalism has completely changed. And it's, it's basically, you have to pay to get something published. What is the dark side? And I, I tried to kind of do some research about the dark side of journalism and, um, you know, that's also another area, um, that you can touch up on, you know, what is, is, is journalism and, you know, news outlets corrupt? Are they, you know, looking for um, money? Um, do we, do you have to have, you know, certain connections? And then you see, you know, certain journalists are, you know, duplicated everywhere. I mean, it's like they have, I mean, you see them 
in their articles in CNN, then in BBC, then in you know, Telegraph, then, I mean, they're working for all these people. What is, you know, what's the journalism world like from your experience? Oh, well, that's a big fat question. Uh, <laughs> here, Jeff. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, let's, <Sorry. laughs> well, let's contextualize this. First of all, I'm a fossil. Uh, I mean, I go back to typewriters, seriously. Um, I, I saw a tweet recently where somebody quoted an article from the Daily Mail and said, internet might be only a fad. <laughs> and then you think, okay, you guys didn't have any crystal ball working. Um, it was hilarious because this was in 1994, I think the article appeared and they were saying this. I thought, my gosh, you guys really were out of step. Um, you got several things going here. Number one, Let's, let's bring it home to what we're talking about. You are dealing with a tremendous amount of ignorance over Africa that has been there for ages. It has nothing to do with technology. It just has to do with inbred practices of the profession that you could be doing like stories, filing them from a spaceship and they would still be just as bigoted and stupid. Uh, and I'll give you a case example. I'm sitting watching BBC World, and I love BBC World, but um, there is a guy yesterday, and he is reporting from Singapore on Myanmar. Well, look up the geography of where Singapore is in relation to Myanmar. Uh, we had a good laugh months ago because somebody was in South Africa, and they were commenting on what was happening in Ethiopia. And look at your map. The distance between where he was in Cape Town to I think Addis Ababa was roughly only a little bit more or less than the distance between Ethiopia and London. The guy could have been commenting from his studio there, but they chose to go to the guy supposedly on the African continent, even though it has absolutely nothing in relationship <laughs> to the Ethiopian situation. And what do you see with the analysts? They pull these people like say Tronville or Davidson because they're lazy, because they want someone who speaks English and sounds articulate uh, to them what sounds articulate instead of going to get an actual African and Ethiopian person to talk to. Um, I've told this story on other uh, forums and so I apologize if somebody's heard it before. I was on a certain television uh, channel uh, in Asia years ago, and they were doing something on um, the Rohingya genocide. And they wanted to talk to me. And I said, well, who are you gonna get for the Rohingya? And it hadn't occurred to them to even go and get a Rohingya spokesperson. And I said, well, I'll go get you one. So I spent like a hour or so two and I found an advocate for a Rohingya organization right in Toronto. And I said, well, you, do you wanna come on this channel and talk with me? Had I not done so, it would have been three guys that look like me, at least two of them bald, uh, talking about a country that none of us lived in um, and that we're not of that culture. And that is nothing to do with the technology. That has to do with stupid prejudices and biases in terms of culture that have to stop. Um, to its credit, BBC has very good African correspondents, but in their mainstream sort of news, they're still doing things where they send, you know, the Economist and the Guardian and others still send the white guy to cover Africa and get a fixer, what they call a fixer, which is the guy who arranges appointments for you, goes, finds you contacts. That's old school that goes right back to the 1920s and 30s. Yeah, now, and when I'm you get to the month, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, another thing that I also noticed is that, you know, um, when they do hire Africans um, for African matters, yep. they, they, I mean, it's great that they have the freedom to write whatever they want, but you would see that a, a particular journalist would be writing a particular um, outlook. And it's almost like they are working in the media for, to promote propaganda themselves. So this is not just, you know, um, um, to say that, you know, European analysts or anything like that. It goes to even um, um, 
African journalists. I mean, it's almost like you see journalists with an agenda, with a propaganda that always write, like, I mean, a simple thing would be to, to cover a story, but then they will completely omit, it's almost like they have a client, they completely omit half of the story or the most important part of the story, and they would be pushing their propaganda and agenda on a topic, and you see them always working on those assignments. Kind well, of we, have to, we have to be very careful there because um, one, I, I see what you're saying. You're talking about credibility issue. Yep. Um, I am loath to criticize any journalist, especially in say a conflict zone, because that can get them into serious safety issues. I would rather, um, if I go after say Tronville, um, Tronville is off in Norway. He can take it. Um, Davidson was deported. I have no problem with going after him now that he's in back in England. Um, he can take it. I did not do anything close to the attacks that I did on Davidson while he was in the country because the fact of the matter is some journalists have been threatened uh, and attacked while in Ethiopia. Uh, Samuel Getachew got attacked by the troll army uh, when he went on television. And you could say, anybody could say, well, he's biased this way, he's biased that way. Um, now, is, am I playing favorites in terms of this? No, I would do the same thing if, say, we had to look at, say, um, like, for instance, RT.com. It's very clearly a propaganda wing of the Russian government. Uh, it's very clearly, but do I want to see a reporter who thinks that they're working for a journalism operation act, go out and act in good faith? And do I want to attack them personally and possibly get them into trouble uh, where they, their safety is in peril? I don't want to do that. I hear what you're saying. I would rather Maybe. go after the institution. I also meant, I also meant about the medias in, in the Western world. Yeah. You know, Africans who write for Western media who are actually kind of, you know, um, yeah. writing a one-sided article consistent. Well, they can be. I mean, they, they can be very much. Um, and I've seen this, <laughs> I've seen this myself. The weird thing is, is that what people outside normally think of as institutional biases are often not even that well thought out. They're more a case of, um, of social culture of the time so that you can ha say have a managing editor come on shift and he brings his own biases and then he goes off shift and the next guy comes and he'll have his own set of biases but because of course they're two white guys uh they're not going to give a damn culturally in terms of doing you know developing world stories or african stories and so you get the coverage i mean one of the operations I was working at in my 20s was, and I think it's reasonable to say this now, was I was working for the broadcast end of Canadian press. There was not a single black person in that newsroom <laughs> except one, uh, sometimes two, and sometimes whole shifts for weeks. You wouldn't see a person of color. So who was representing that point of view? Not just, never mind Africa, just for black people in say North America. How are you gonna get an informed perspective? And that was back in the eighties. Uh, now it's better, but, and hopefully it's better in my city and hopefully it's better in you know the newsrooms of Seattle to Washington DC or so forth. But we also gotta make the distinction between black American, African American perspective and say bringing a culturally informed, news informed perspective of African news, because there are still lots of white editors who think the two are indistinguishable. And they think, oh, every black person is going to understand Africa. And you know yourself, they don't. <laughs> and that's not taken away from them. That's just culture and social, social elements and where you are geographically. Why should you be expected to understand what's going on in Tanzania or whatever? Um, but for them, they think, oh, this is indistinguishable. In terms of the agenda, though, it's not always that organized. Sometimes it is. Um, I would say, you know, 
we don't have to look far to look at what Fox News is doing, which is pure white supremacist hate speech half the time, <laughs> uh, is incredibly overt. Um, it's harder with other operations. They can be, they can be fooled and suckered completely. Um, consider the example of what happened with Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda was portrayed as, oh, it's a vicious battle between tribes, Hutus and Tutsis. It took years to come out that this was a very organized, orchestrated genocide campaign. It was well organized and it was set in motion and people didn't know, people didn't understand. I mean, look what happens every stupid Christmas. Somebody starts playing, do they, do they know it's Christmas time? Yeah, dummies, <laughs> of course they know it's Christmas time. They had Christianity since the fourth century. And yet that tune still plays for famine relief and they have no clue, you know, um, because that's what they see. They see Africa in terms of war, famine, um, disease, corruption. When's the last time you saw a happy story about Africa in terms of the nightly news? Because conflict drives the news agenda. It's not even sometimes about left and right. It becomes about what, what, what can we show? Uh, you must have heard or read at least the anecdote, which I told him uh, in one of the articles and where the guy says to me, I don't care why the Africans are fighting just show the Africans fighting. And my jaw could have dropped. And you're just going, and you're standing there, you don't know whether to slug the guy or just walk out. <laughs> you know, that's the way they think. There's not even a left and right. Um, they've, picked their, they've picked their favorites in terms of this particular conflict. And notice what's happening in terms of the way the narrative has subtly changed. It went from, um, the Ethiopian government is at war with this region of people. And they never talked about the TPLF. They just said, well, an election was denied these people. Forget that there was COVID and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not gonna second guess the Ethiopian government or what was, whether that was a right or wrong decision. It's not for me to say. I'm telling, I'm reviewing what the narrative was. Narrative, exactly. And part of that narrative was, well, the TPLF are battle-hardened troops. Remember the expression, the battle-hardened troops who are gonna make it a long and they've already fought all these wars and they go, well, that didn't last long, did it? <laughs> that went by really quick. Um, and I then mean, it became- But, but you, you, exactly what I'm saying is the narrative and the promotion of this kind of um, encouragement, you know? Yep encouraging the conflict and uh, yep. like you said taking sides and creating more divisions and yep. saying that we care about you more than your own you know um, leaders and your own citizens and and you know the, the whole thing turns out to be like you said you know planned or orchestrated yep. they wanted an underdog fight they wanted they wanted to pick an underdog and it served their purposes to say, oh, this region is the underdog without even bothering to do their homework on what was involved. Um, and so what happened with the Babel Haran troops? Oh, suddenly that disappeared and that became, oh, it's all about the guerrilla war. And so now you don't hear much about the guerrilla war anymore because <laughs> that got mopped up. You hear it here and there. And then it became about the humanitarian crisis. And if you read the article by Lawrence Freeman, who did the math that reporters should have done and said, hey, there are already so many million who were on aid and needed and were starving and were trouble in Tigray and hmm, who was supposed to be taking care of them? Um, nobody pays attention to that. So now what is the argument now? The argument now is how is the Abbey government prosecuting the war? And nobody says, if you have a war, that automatically means that there's another side that's fighting you. Where's their responsibility? Where is this? So now we're seeing, as you said, in globalization, now we're seeing a weird thing, which I don't think anybody of my generation has seen before. Uh, 
where you can comment on a war and you don't even need to be there. <laughs> you can just openly speculate and say, well, we have these geolocation satellites of pictures and they scribble all over it so you can't see what's going on. And we've interviewed these witnesses, which we haven't validated whether what they're verified, whether what they're saying is true. And my position to be crystal clear about this is, I am not discounting the witness statements of refugees who say these things. I'm saying, go and check, go on the ground and see, go do actual reporting and go there. Um, and, verify, and we still and haven't seen information, you know, we verify information yeah. and, you know, do a little bit more of a deep study because as you know, um, you know, there are groups who are, um, who are, you know, solely doing things for propaganda too. Yep. And um, the only way you can uh, weed those out is when you are genuinely looking for information. And uh, already going there with wanting to do a specific story. You know, if you already have the conclusion, then you're just filling in the blanks. Yep. Um, and they will. I, can, I, I will predict now. And please make me wrong. By all means, by all means prove me wrong. Because I'm going to predict now that the New York Times and The Guardian and The Economist and uh, others will sh show up there. They are, they are getting access to Tigray places now. Um, so all this nonsense of, well, you're not laying in the media, blah, blah. Yes, you're laying in the media. We have video of the aid groups. Like <laughs> we have a video of aid gang to the region. We, you know, I've seen dispatches from, excuse me, France 24 and others. So I know there are reporters in the region and they're getting more access to the region. Um, Oh, and by the way, let's make, let's make another point. And this is a point from one of my contacts who said, when they, when they, pardon my language, bitched and complained about not having access, in every conflict war zone, there are certain times where the authorities say, no, we're, you can't go to that area. There's lots of fighting. Good area. You know, it's not safe. And then they say, well, you're denying us access no dummies, we don't want you to get shot. <laughs> it's for your own protection. So now they're getting more access. And um, I predict, I hope I'm wrong. I'm, I'm waiting for me to be wrong. Please prove me wrong. But they're going to get exactly what they're looking for. They're going to confirm their narratives. Uh, I will be very surprised if they don't. They will find whoever they can get to, uh, because think how silly they're going to look if they don't. I have no vested interest in being right here. It, you know, if somebody, I, I got people attacking me on social media who say, well, you're backing this side and you're going to find out blah, blah, blah. And I go, okay, yeah. Uh, because the Ethiopians that I speak to in communities here and elsewhere say, we just want to know the truth. They don't have any hate in their heart. They want to know what really went on. If it turns out that people were abused, tortured, uh, people shot, they want to know. Their relatives, there's millions of Ethiopians who are of mixed heritage, who might have, say, an Amhara father or grandfather and a Tigrayan mother, you know, or Romo Amhara. They're all mixed up in terms of their heritage. They don't have any ill will and the Western media is portraying this as uh, one ethnic region or these ethnic regions versus one. And it's not like that. You know that. It's not. So, and I mean, this is taking but, away from the victims, like you said. Yeah. We know, um, I mean, including myself, I'm, you know, I'm concerned about the victims. I'm concerned about the, um, you know, the, the difficulties that citizens would be facing when there's a conflict. It's heartbreaking. This is not what Ethiopians want. This is not just what a, a specific area wanted. This is not what any Ethiopian want. Nobody wants conflict in their country. Nobody wants any, um, any victims and nobody wants anybody to starve or get hurt. And, and honestly speaking, you know, people want to mobilize from all over the world and help. I mean, this is the time that we actually 
need more aid. And we're actually, Ethiopia has, I mean, had several countries say, we're not giving you aid at this time because, yeah. you know, um, because you're not giving us access, like you said. And to me about access too is like, I mean, you couldn't get access uh, in the capital when all the uh, craziness was going on. You couldn't go in there as a journalist while things were going, you know, uh, going crazy. It was people who were taking pictures who happened to be there. You couldn't get access to, uh, you know, a zone that there is uh, mm -hmm. you know, conflict or chaos. Um, so I don't know, you know, why that hasn't even really been very much considered or even talked about. Um, but instead, it was like, you know, Ethiopia, you know, is not getting access, like basically denying other people, um, uh, other countries or media. Um, I mean, even even if there was, look at the results, you know, look at the results of not only safety issue, but you see media actually making things worse for the country, uh, causing more division amongst the people because medias are coming with their own agenda. Um, anyway, I think we can go on and on. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you. I mean, it's great to hear, you know, how you think. I'm pretty sure there are many people that would um, appreciate um, listen to, listening to um, your ideas and discussion. Um, I think um, we should be getting close to wrapping up. So I wanted I wanted you to talk about your um, your book. Um, and since this is Adwa time, I mean, um, uh, I have already bought my book a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but oh, it makes an excellent present for other people. I remember I sent it here actually. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, um, for to encourage our audiences if they. Um, I actually suggested you, do you have that book in Ethiopia and so forth? So um, they can find out about um, your book. Tell us more about your book and one good uh, story uh, from your book that, you know, that will kind of encourage uh, for those of us who want to be united and, you know, for those who, who have a different feeling or ideas, um, uh, to say, you know, uh, there is nothing like uh, unity and how important it is um, to be strong. In order to be strong, uh, we need to be unified. So take it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, just, just a disclaimer. Uh, if you, I don't know how you can add it in. I am not condemning all Western media. There are some very okay. responsible reporters awesome. in there, um, but they can do their job better. We're not. Um, this yep. is not anti anyone yep. or any yep. administration exactly. or any. Exactly. This is a discussion about yep. you know, obviously some of the things yep. that are negatively highlighted right now. Yep. Um, and we obviously, you know, welcome yep. um, all people from all over the world in Ethiopia. Ethiopia um, is a very friendly country. Um, we love. Um, we love, uh, you know, people from all over the world yep. and um, we welcome them even in our, you know, in all <laughs> thing, <laughs> yeah. and, and enjoying our culture and, um, you know, uh, our country and everything. We want to encourage um, people to encourage us for better things, not for yep. anything that is going to um, divide us. And uh, that would, that, that, that's, you know, not going to be Ethiopian. Yep. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of a good story, uh, oh God, there's so many. Um, it's, well, here's, here's an apt one uh, because I met the man and I count myself lucky to have met the man. Um, and I, I think of him a lot lately because um, Jigama Kello, who is the Patriot hero. And the thing is, I didn't even know he was a Romo until after I got home um, and made no, never mind to me. If you read the book, it doesn't go into the ethnicities of each and every player because that would have, when I wrote this book, this book was originally written really within mind of educating Westerners. And hopefully I was hoping the audience would be mostly African-American who would like this book and go, wow, this is a part of black history that we don't get there. And it turned out that really my readers were 
diaspora Ethiopians who said, hey, nobody's told our story like this before. Fantastic, which was wonderful for me either way. Um, so the thing is, there was no ethnicities in because that's not the main message of the book anyway. And it was irrelevant. It would have been very hard for, for a Western reader to follow. But why it's apt now is Jigama Kello is the type of guy who, <laughs> I don't know if your, your viewers will be familiar with him. He was the type of guy who's, he's a young guy and he sees somebody walking through his village who's a big man, you know, in terms of respected because he's killed a wild animal. He goes, well, I should, I should go kill a wild animal like a lion or something and that'll get me respect. And so somebody comes along and goes, well, you know, the Italians are killing our people. Maybe you should hunt them instead. Okay. <laughs> so he goes off and becomes a patriot. And this is a boy. You can see photos of him. He's got the big ass Afro. He's skinny as a rail. And he starts out when he's 15. And by the time he's within five years, by the time he's 20 years old, he's like leading 3,500 men. And his personality is just, he's really got natural charisma. He had natural charisma even when I met him and he's sick in bed. And this is a guy who- How do you pronounce his name? I want to hear it again. Well, I said Jigama Kello and I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. I hope so. Or Jagama Kello. I hope, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it properly. No, no, no. Jagama Kello. Jagama. But the thing is, Jagama was the type of guy who, <laughs> he gets a message from, Haile Selassie in the last days of the campaign in a mop-up operation. And he gets a note and Haile Selassie, the emperor is saying, you should go down here and help this particular patriot leader. And he looks at the note and goes, he doesn't know me. Crumple throws it away. <laughs> you know, he's, he's the emperor. And a, a famous female patriot whose name I cannot pronounce if I try, I will butcher the pronunciation, so I apologize. She goes to the emperor and goes, just he's a boy like take it easy on the guy so the emperor sends him another note and goes i'm telling you please go do this this is an order from your emperor so finally he does and he gets wounded and he doesn't want to cut off his hair because of course the patriots thought you know they grow out the hair this is their strength and it scared the crap out of the Italians, or so they thought. And I can see it. I can see how why they thought that way. But he goes into the medical ward, and the British are supposed to be taking care of him, and they insist that he cut his hair. And he's sick. He's sick with something like malaria or so. He's lying in bed going, mm -mm, nope, not going to do it. Nope. And the emperor has to come to his bedside and goes, I think you should cut this. <laughs> I think you should cut this. So finally... By this time, he's grown to respect the emperor. He goes, oh, okay, fine, I'll cut my hair. Like, what type of a guy is able, through that force of personality, to do that? And he has adventures like that all the time. He was just a larger-than-life figure. But why I bring him up is there are critics who say to me, well, he was part of the Amhara elite. I'm going, oh, for God's sake, what does it matter the fact is, he was a Romo, and he believed in Ethiopia, and he fought for Ethiopia as one guy leading other people who all came together to fight for Ethiopia when they needed it from these fascist invaders who were gassing people with poison gas, dropping bombs on them. Who the hell cared at the time, whether you were Tigrayan, Amhara, Garagi, a Romo, the Italians sure didn't care while they were killing you. Um, so they came together and fought as one. And this guy was one of them. And we respect him now, not because of his ethnic background. We respect him because of who he was as a person and how courageous he was as an individual. So that's that book. And the new book, which I will have out next year, called African Ideas, How a Continent and Its People Changed the World, there's a good portion of Ethiopia in it. And I tell this war in a one chapter in a shorter version, but there's a lot of Ethiopian history in there, which should be an example for the rest of the world. Uh, for the philosopher Zara Yaakov, 
um, the nun Walata Petros, who stood up to Susanios. Um, there's a wonderful economist uh, fellow whose name I don't want to butcher, um, but had an amazing life and uh, became an advisor to Menelik. And Westerners have probably never heard of this guy. And he came up with some astounding ideas, which were ahead of his time. And all of that is in Ethiopian history that people got to know about uh, that I want to share with the world. And it's there for you guys too. So. Great. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful, Jeff. I think, um, yeah, I believe, um, you know, it's not ethnicity that, you know, that makes us who we are. It's actually our ethics, our work, our relationships, our, um, how we treat others and how we, um, how we are as a person. And I think Jag Makelo's character that you um, explained and how you, you know, you, you thought that he was bigger than life. I think that's really what's important is that we, um, um, we build a character um, uh, rather than, you know, focusing on um, uh, the other things that divide us. So I think that's a great message and I'm looking forward. Here yep. he is. That's Here he is. Look at this guy. Oh. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Very um, good looking as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has hair. <laughs> so, <laughs> lucky guy. So, there's that. <laughs> Well, I really, really appreciate you, Jeff, for um, taking your time and really joining me have this discussion. I think uh, the Ethiopian audience is really going to enjoy this, so I really appreciate you. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, hope to see you uh, another time with another guest. Thanks. 